2 Corinthians 3 says, Paul talking to the Corinthians, not an easy book to read because he's upset with them, and he's, he's doing a lot of correcting in 2 Corinthians, right? But here he's saying, you are our epistle written in our hearts. That's beautiful language, isn't it? So he was there, he won them to the Lord, and he's saying that the evidence of your serving the Lord is, is an open epistle. Like, you guys are the epistle, not something written down. You're written on our hearts, and you're known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ. You know what I'm talking about, right? So that people could watch you, and they're reading the Bible in your actions. Well, they're reading something in our actions. <laughs> we want it to be the Bible. So maybe take a fast from Facebook for a little while and look back on your comments and say, was I reflecting an epistle in, in, in those comments? And look, I'm not trying to be condemning. I'm just saying everything matters to God. Yeah. Everything we say, like every word matters. So be careful. Let's all be careful that you don't do what Moses did and let your emotions get in the way and release the wrong thing when he cares so much about other people and how we treat them. All right, so clearly you're an epistle of Christ, and basically he's saying ministered by us. In another translation, it says we were the ones that were writing it down, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is of the heart. And look, you know, I don't know how to explain it easily, but you all know that Jesus wasn't religious, right? He, he had a relationship with the Father, and that's what got us in the kingdom, Religion, you know, kills. The letter of the law without the spirit kills. The Father's seeking for those who worship him in spirit and in truth. It's important to know the truth, but it's also important to deliver it with oil. There's got to be some compassion. There's got to be uh, an ability to say, Lord, not just what to say, but how to say it. And deliver the truth, but do it in love. Right. Don't tell them what they're doing is okay if you know they're in sin. That's not loving them. But do it in a way that they can hear you. I could show you so many examples of Jesus doing that in Scripture. But for now, let's just think about this one. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Can you say all things? All things. Look at somebody say all things. all things. That's an important phrase. Everything you need, He's already given to you. But are we accessing it? Are we unpacking it properly? Do we understand it properly? And, you know, if I had to give a scene in a movie, which you know I like to do because it's easy to remember, you might remember the movie Sully. And, you know, we're so close to New York City here. It was that miracle on the Hudson, 2,800 feet in the air. They hit a flock of geese, and 208 seconds later, they were on the water in the Hudson River. So that's three minutes and change, right? You didn't have a lot of time to think. Anybody know the scene I'm talking about in the movie when he's sitting before the Inquisition and they're running the models and they're showing him, well, we did the simulation and the simulation shows you could have made it to Fort Lee and you could have made it to LaGuardia. And it's like, oh, really? Because I love the scene. He goes, let's get serious after they make the charge. He goes, let's get serious. And, and everybody in the audience is like, what are you talking about? You know, he said, basically, you took away the human factor. Nobody has ever lost two all engines at 2,800 feet with a full load in a plane that size. You ran your simulation, but I'm curious, how many times did they get to practice the simulation? They knew immediately that they're supposed to turn. How many times? Remember the number? 17 times. They already knew what to do, and it still took them 17 times to practice it. And the whole audience is going, oh, my God, how did we miss that? Where's the human factor? And that's what I want to just say today is that's missing in a lot of, of, of the religious approach to talking to people about God. You can't forget the human factor. You have to build a relationship with people. They've got to know you and trust you and, and respect you if you expect them to trust what you're saying. And it's not just a simulation on a computer, Right? So they said back and forth, and so they, he says, all right, well, how about this? Can you give me a little time to react? I'm about to die. This has never happened before. No one's ever trained for this. Do you think you could build a little time into the simulation? So they gave him 35 seconds. That's like a half a commercial. 35 seconds to save 153 or 155, I forget now. 
all those things are going through your head at the same time. He didn't have time to open the glove box and look in the manual. He had to react, boom, 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 right at one, right after another. And it's ironic because he's a glider pilot by training, you know, talk about the right person at the right spot. And in fact, they looked at it afterwards. If he had done what was in the manual, they would have all died. But because he was so familiar and he so reacted, it was second nature saved 155 people. And I don't know if you see the movie, at the very end, they bring the survivors into the airplane hangar. And he says, it really hit me. It wasn't just the people on the plane that we saved. The ripple effect of all those other people that were related to them that were there. And, and you see somebody's face come up and she says, 15B, 22C, all the different blah, right? Because one guy kept his cool, didn't panic. It's really hard not to panic when you think you're about to die. And that's what Holy Spirit will do for us. That's what I'm asking you to do, is trust him not to just give a religious answer, speak the word, do it in love, but also say what we said today. I'm not enough unless you come. But when you come, boy, we can get great things done for the kingdom, right? Yeah. <clears throat> you heard the joke about the flea on the back of the elephant, and they had to go across this rickety bridge, and they go rumbling over it, and, and the flea looks at the elephant and says, boy, we really rocked that thing, didn't we? <laughs> We're taking all kinds of credit that we don't deserve. But being willing to be there in the middle as God is speaking through you, right? If you, got, if you ever get arrogant about it, remember that the donkey that spoke in the Old Testament was still a donkey after he spoke. <laughs> Selah. <laughs> He's given me and you all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's such an awesome thing to think. I don't know how to apply it all yet, but it's been given to me. So if I dig in the word, that I could find the treasure of the word, for all the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which would be given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you might be a partaker of the divine nature. When Moses struck the rock, he was not partaking of the divine nature. That was his carnal nature. His frustration and his anger was coming up to the surface. It doesn't mean that you, you, don't, you can't ever be angry, right? Because the Bible says, be angry and sin not. It also says Jesus was angry and never sinned. How many of you find it a little harder than Jesus probably found it? Yeah, so let's just be careful, right? That we don't think, well, it's a righteous anger. Okay. Stand before the Lord someday. Hopefully he agrees with you. <laughs> I'm going to just cut through this one a little faster. Um, it's in the message translation, and it's that picture that sounds really hard to do when Paul said, I became all things to all people that I might win Anybody? Some. <laughs> and you're like, wow, would have thought he would have said all. But he's recognizing all we can do is our part, right? And one plants and another one waters and, and God gives the increase. And we're going to stand before the Lord someday and he's going to say, okay, well, you were alive during the biggest crisis in your lifetime, in my case, a really long time. What did you do to help people understand there was a better message because you're probably never going to have a more open time than right now to talk to people about how important the Lord is in their lives. They just lived through a year of lockdown. And fear is just rampant still, right? And I, don't shame them. Don't shame people if, just because you don't agree with the way they're thinking about mass or the other things. It's like, no, this is an opportunity to talk to another person that God loves. And he really cares about how we approach them. So he says this, Paul, I voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. And then he lists a long list there that I spared you of. But he said, I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. That is profound. Not everybody's taught that. You know, when I was a new Christian, I was taught to go to the park and hand out tracts and and give people the message, which is fine. I'm, again, I'm not criticizing that. It's still evangelism. It's good to do it. But it's that Holy Spirit peace, that little bit of a different peace that really can cross us over and not just look like uh, 
it's too mechanical. People are not mechanical. They're, they're alive. They're hurting. They don't know whether they should share their heart with you. But one of the ways you know this is working, but people, people will be talking to you and they'll say, I don't know why I'm telling you this. I never say this to anybody. Wow. You know, so that's a sign that the Lord is there, right? Yeah. That there, there's something happening in the transaction where they trust you. I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world. This could be 30 seconds, right? Like the, It's not a big, long thing. It's just asking the Lord, show me what you see. I don't want to look at what I'm seeing. I want, I want to see what you see when you look at that person. Because I don't want to strike the rock. When you say speak to the rock. The water's just right here, ready, flow out of me. Rivers of living water. That means the word you use could save someone's life. Right. Oh, that's a pretty big responsibility, but I'll tell you what. Be prayed up before you leave the house in the morning. Right. And if you're driving towards New York, really be prayed up. <laughs> you could lose your salvation on Route 3. Right. 